In this episode, we'll consider the question of whether tax cuts really do stimulate the economy, whether helping renters is actually a good way to hurt them, and whether mining is really the backbone of Australia's regional economy or not. Thanks for watching Ask an Economist. If you'd like us to answer one of your questions, you can send one in to mail at australiainstitute.org.au and make sure you include Ask an Economist in the subject line. Welcome back, Richard. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we have a question today from Nick. He asks, is there any evidence on a macro scale that tax cuts are stimulatory? And is there any evidence from anywhere in the world that economic stimulation through tax cuts increases tax revenue? Ah, oh, thanks Nick for the question. Hand it over here, Matt. Let's, let's decode some econobabble first. So stimulatory. Well, macro scale. When economists talk about macro scale, they mean big picture. Yeah. So when we talk about the economy as a whole, unemployment as a whole, inflation across the economy, that's a macro thing. Micro is more like what happened to, Mac, what happened to Matt's income tax cuts. Or so, what happens to an individual business. Yeah, so micro means little, macro means big. So what happens, is there evidence at a macro scale that tax cuts are stimulatory? Now, stimulatory just means that uh, we're expanding the size of the economy. So you hear governments talk about jobs and growth. Uh, so tax cuts, we're often told, are a good way to stimulate the economy. So Matt, how would a tax cut stimulate the economy before well, we talk about the evidence? If you give me a tax cut, Richard, yep. I've got more dollars in my pocket. I go out and spend them on stuff at my local shops. My local shops have therefore uh, are selling more stuff. Uh, more stuff needs to get made. Uh, and therefore more people need to be employed to make that stuff. Right, so we, we collect taxes from individuals, from companies, from all sorts of sources, and when governments are collecting those resources in a tax, we don't leave them in Matt's hands or my hands. So one way to stimulate the economy, to get people to spend more money and hopefully create more jobs, is to give us tax cuts. Nick says, is there any evidence that it can be stimulatory? Well, yeah, there is, because as Matt said, if he's got more dollars in his pocket, then you know he can spend some more money. The question is, of all the ways to stimulate the economy, are tax cuts the best way? And the whole idea of trickle-down economics is that the best way to stimulate the economy, to make it grow, to create jobs, is give tax cuts to high income earners, brackets, most of whom are blokes, and they'll go out and spend a lot of money on whatever it is they want, you know, boats and cars and caviar and lobsters or uh, I don't know what. Overseas holidays. Overse well, once upon a time. Yeah, not anymore. So, so the idea that if we cut taxes, especially for high income earners, they'll flood the economy with money and that'll create jobs. And that's what trickle down economics really is. So Matt, now let's try and answer Nick's question. Is there any evidence from anywhere in the world that economic stimulation through tax cuts increases tax revenue. How could that be? How could cutting taxes lead to an increase in tax revenue? Well, the idea behind it is that if you cut um, tax revenue, particularly for high income earners, and this all came out of the Reagan tax cuts in the early 80s. Didn't yeah. they call it voodoo economics? Yeah, it did. Yes. And, uh, and by the way, this is actually where trickle down economics came from, from this tax cut, this idea. The idea was that rich people are the most important people because they're the ones that own the businesses. They're the ones that employ everybody. Well, they're rich. They must be important. Exactly right. And this might sound familiar because the gov our current government is very big on business being the people who employ. Um, and the idea is, is if we give them enough money, then they'll go out and they'll do their business thing. They'll produce more stuff and they'll employ more people. And so therefore all these extra people and all this extra economic activity will then get taxed at the new lower rate, but it'll overall tax revenue will actually increase. It's almost like the we can, we can fund the tax cut by expanding the economy. Right, so what, what it really means is that yes, we, we, we cut the tax rate, so the, the proportion of Matt's income that he pays in tax or the proportion of tax that a company pays on its profits, even though we cut the tax rate, you'd think that means government collects, collect less, less tax, but the idea of trickle-down economics, voodoo economics, as, as George Bush Sr. actually named oh, it. I thought that was Ferris Bueller. <laughs> that too. Um, the idea behind that is that by cutting the rate, we grow the cake and a smaller tax rate in a bigger, in a bigger economy equals more tax revenue. So let's try and answer Nick's question again. Is there any evidence that that's ever worked, Matt? Well, the self-funding tax cut, no. There has never any, been any evidence 
um, that the tax cut can fund itself. That is the economic activity that it stimulates in some way funds it. And in fact, that was the idea out of the Reagan tax cuts. And they were, if, if that was the objective, a fundamental failure. They, they, th there was billions and billions of dollars lost in revenue by the government and the economic activity it stimulated didn't even come close to funding the tax cuts. So what happened to budget deficits under Reagan? They ballooned. They got much bigger and they got much bigger right. because they cut tax. And, and, and when, uh, when Donald Trump Trump cut taxes, what happened to the deficit? Well, it ballooned again. And in oh. fact, um, you know, the, the US has, you know, some of the largest amounts of debt anywhere in the world. And that's exploded recently because of these tax cuts. Right. So in answer to Nick's question, sorry, Nick, no, there's no evidence of this. Uh, the theory is that if we cut people's taxes a little bit, it'll stimulate so much activity that the lower tax rate multiplied by the bigger economy equals more revenue. It could happen in theory. An economist called Laffer suggested it. Ronald Reagan was the first one to say, let's give it a red hot go. And what has happened time and time again, including in Australia, is we cut taxes for high income earners, promising it'll help low income earners eventually. Trickle down. It'll trickle down. But what tends to happen is the, the high income earners get a tax cut. It doesn't stimulate much activity. We get big budget deficits. And you know what? Then we turn around and say, we're going to have to cut spending on health and cut spending on unemployment and cut spending on services because... We need to reduce the budget deficit. Conservatives love to reduce budget deficits um, by uh, cutting spending, but they love to create budget deficits by cutting tax. Yep. So thanks to your question, Nick, and the short answer is no. Oh, there's been a lot about uh, mining, in particular coal mining, in the news at the moment. So the mining industry and its advocates are often claiming that mining is really important industry regionally. They claim that, ma that it makes up more than half the income of some regions. Firstly, is this true? And also, how important is the mining industry both to Australia as a whole and to the regions? Oh, thanks, Matt. Well, let's start with the second bit. Um, uh, mining is it's an important industry in Australia. It employs tens of thousands of people. Uh, and, and we should never trivialise anyone's job, whether it's working in a coal mine or working in a nursing home. So, of course, mining makes an important contribution to the economy. Um, you know, people like me get accused of, you know, hating miners for pointing out things like, the fact that 99.5% of people don't work in coal mining. Like most people in Australia don't work in coal mining. Most people in Australia don't work in mining. That's not meant as an insult to the people who do. But, you know, let's be clear, if there were 100 people, uh, if there were 100 people in a room, half of one of them would, would work in coal mining. Now, mining is not evenly spread out through the economy. Like there are no coal mines in Sydney. Um, it's probably one of the reasons people in Sydney think coal mining's good, because they don't get the noise, they don't get the air pollution, they don't get any of the downsides. So coal mining is located, not surprisingly, in places that have a lot of coal under the ground and don't have a lot of people nearby. For example, the Upper Hunter in New South Wales uh, is one of the you know, most coal intensive parts of Australia. And, and in the Upper Hunter, 93% of people don't work in coal mining. So, so it's still not even the majority in the Upper Hunter. Well, it's, it's not even 10%. It's around 7% of people in the Upper Hunter work in coal. Now, again, is, is that important for that 7%? Yes. Is it important for their families? Yes. You know, but the idea that coal is the major employer uh, in, in any region in Australia is just demonstrably untrue. Now, uh, Mark Latham, former Labor leader and current One Nation uh, parliamentarian, recently said that 40% of people uh, in Singleton, which is in the Upper Hunter, uh, are employed in coal mining. The ABS says it's more like 20%. So people are always exaggerating the size of the coal mining industry. But you know, 20%, that's a lot of people in a town. Mm. So again, we have to understand that the fact that people currently work in coal is really important for them and their incomes is, is, is true. But when we suggest that a whole region or a whole country depend on a particular industry, well, well, well that's just nonsense. So the, part of the question is, some of the advocates of mining claim that um, more than half of the income in some regions comes from mining. Ah, that's Mark Latham again, um, <laughs> who, who called me a lefty fairy for pointing out what the Australian Bureau of Statistics actually says about coal mining. Um, 
so yeah, so what Mark Latham said is that uh, around two thirds of the regional, gross regional product, the, the total amount of stuff produced uh, in the Upper Hunter, he says two thirds of that comes from, from coal mining. And then he went on to say that's like saying that two thirds of households get their income from coal. Now, that's not true. Now, we're gonna to have to explain a little bit of economics here, but luckily, that's the point of this show. We're economists. We're economists, so here it is. Um, when uh, someone makes a glass, makes some water, makes a jacket, the way we record the value of whatever is produced in gross domestic product, we look at where it's produced and we can calculate gross national product, if this jacket was made in Australia, we can gro say gross state product if this was made in New South Wales, or if a particular region a jacket was made in, we say, well, what was the regional production? We just literally add up the value of everything that was produced in that region. Now, it's true that there's an enormous production of coal in the Upper Hunter, and, and the people at the Australian Bureau of Statistics attribute all of the value of all of the coal produced in the Hunter to the region where the coal mine is. But the value of a jacket, the value of a glass, or the value of what's produced in a coal mine includes not just the wages it pays, but the profit that it earns. Is coal mining profitable, Richard? Coal mining is extremely profitable if, if you've got a nice rich coal seam that we gave you the cheap for, for cheap. Now what happens with coal is that nearly every coal mine in Australia is owned overseas. So if I dig up a tonne of coal, and, uh, and I sell the, top, the coal for $80, if I spend $10 on labor, and I spend $10 on equipment and stuff, and I make $60 in profit on the coal, that $60 profit, that gets posted back to Switzerland, it gets posted back to England, it gets posted back uh, to the US, to the owners of the coal mine, but when the Australian Bureau of Statistics looks at the total value of production in the Upper Hunter, they include all of the profits that came with that production. So yeah. even though nearly all of the money from coal production leaves the region never to be seen again, the statistics say that it's that region that generated the profit. Yeah, so I went on the um, ABS website and I had a look and on average for coal mining in Australia, for, for every um, $100 of uh, coal um, sold, 40% of that, $40 of that goes in profit to the foreign-owned mi um, mining company, and 7% gets paid in wages. Right. So the wages for digging up the coal are, are, are far more likely to stay in the region, but they're actually only a very small part of it. The profit is by far and away the largest part of it, um, and it will go to the foreign owners of the coal mining company. So if we attribute the entire $100 from that coal just to the region, and we, then we say that all of it's staying in the region, well, that's simply not true. At least 40% of its profit and almost all of that profit will go overseas. Yeah, and here's the easiest way to think about it. If, if, if there was this enormous wealth that came to the regions that mine coal, how come all the wealthy people live in Sydney and how come incomes are relatively low in regional Australia where there's coal mines? So yes, there's a small number of very highly paid people who work in the coal mines, but again, 97% of people don't, and most of the wealth that comes with the coal mining goes to the owners of the company in profit, or uh, some of it's paid in royalties uh, to the New South Wales government, but guess what? The royalties don't get spent in the region where, where the air pollution is and where the noise is and where the dust is. Uh, those royalties are paid into the New South Wales government. So if, if the Upper Hunter was so rich on coal, how come it doesn't have the best schools? How come it doesn't have the best hospitals? How come it doesn't have the best public transport? How come all the good services are in Sydney and all the air pollution's in the Upper Hunter? Now, the answer is because we attribute all of the value of the coal to where it got dug out of the ground, but most of the checks are getting posted well out of the Upper Hunter. And it gets even better. Even though that uh, product gets uh, assigned to Australia and, and that particular region, if the coal is being, say, exported to Japan and, say, the company is a Swiss company, then the Japanese company buying the coal is going to write a cheque and send it from Japan 
to Switzerland, where the head office of the company is. So those dollars won't even enter Australia. That profit doesn't even cross our border. It counts as our GDP, our gross domestic product. It counts for that regional product and state product, but it never actually enters the country. So the ABS is keeping track of the value of the stuff that's produced, not where the money flowed. Absolutely. Huh. So when Mark Latham says that two thirds of the income of people in the Upper Hunter is attributable to coal, he's making shit up. Or he's counting all the rich Swiss people in Switzerland. <laughs> okay, our next question's about rent. There's arguments anecdotally, Matt, that increasing protections for renters that we did during the pandemic, like freezing rent increases and making it harder to evict people, some people argue that this is causing landlords to sell up and uh, that there's going to be a, a shortage of investment properties and that all these attempts to help renters are going to hurt renters. Um, what's, what's the economic theory behind this, don't help the renters, you're really just hurting them? Yeah, look, we get this quite a lot and a lot of people misunderstand um, the rental market and the property market generally. And so the idea is that, um, you know, the, the, the rental price is, is obviously a product of how many rental properties there are and how many people want to rent. If more people want to rent and there's less rental properties, then you would expect the price to go up. The problem with that in the property market is, is a house that can be rented, is it any different to a house that an owner occupier could live in? If a, if a house goes on the market and there's an auction, is that, are there special rental only houses and owner occupier only houses? Well, not in the economic textbooks I know, but um, yeah, so don't tell me more. <laughs> so, so either it could, be, it could be used for either, which means that the rental market and the owner occupier property market are actually one and the same thing. That means let's say that uh, Richard, you, you own an investment property and you're sick of it because you know these, these um, renters are getting it too good, you can't throw them out. Renters have had it too good for too long in Australia, Matt. Double their rent, Ugh. you can't, you know. Um, I want to evict them in the middle of a crisis. Exactly and, oh. right. You've got to change their uh, hot water when it breaks down at 10 o'clock at night. Oh, the humanity. You're just outraged by all this, so you decide to get out of the market. I'm out. You're out. So do you just burn the property down? Do you leave it vacant? Do you get rid of it? Well, I was planning on selling it and making an enormous capital gain. Okay, so you sell it, all right? So let's say you don't sell it to another investor. Let's say you sell it to a family who want to move in. That means that after you've done that, there's one less rental property on the market. <gasps> so that'll drive rents up. Well, you'd think so. Less rental properties, same amount of renters. Mm -hmm. But there aren't the same amount of renters because the person who bought it off you, that property off you, they're people who want to live in it and they're probably renting at the moment. All right, so sure, we have one less rental property. We can take the number of rental properties out of the market, but we have one more owner-occupied house. So we have more owner-occupiers and less renters. So if I'm a landlord and I sell my house, I can either sell it to another landlord, in which case no change, no in the change rental properties, or I can sell it to someone who's currently renting in which case there's one less rental property and one less renter. And so again, there's no change. So it's as if it's complete rubbish to suggest that by helping renters, we're, we're, we're gonna hurt renters in the long run. Yeah, look, if, if suddenly people decided that investing in residential property was a bad way to make money and they all instead turned and decided to invest in small businesses or invest in the stock market or invest in the bond market, all that would happen is, is house prices wouldn't increase as fast and all those people who were desperate to get in the market, all the, the first home buyers would suddenly be able to afford to live, uh, buy their own home right. and well, would be living in their own home rather than renting. Well, I want to talk about this idea that I own an investment property because uh, I don't. No, it'd be exciting right. to think of Hy it. Hypothetical. Hypothetically. So I've got my rental property and I could sell it to a landlord, which won't affect anyone, or I can sell it to uh, I can sell it to someone who's currently renting, in which case there's one less, one less rental property on the market, but one less renter in the market. But I could, I could destroy my house and turn it into a market garden, or you I could? could rip up my house and, I don't know, put some swings on it or something or other. So if I got rid of my house, would that have an impact on rent? Yeah, it would, because we would have one less house 
in in the market in that particular city or town. All right, and and that would mean that there, if there are the same number of, of um, households or families looking for a house, then we've got one less house. That's going to drive up the price. Right. And what if, say, the government did something old fashioned, like built public housing for people and increased the supply of of housing? What would what would that do to rents? Well, that would decrease rents because you'd have more property coming onto the market. And assuming that uh, everything else remained the same, then um, you would expect that the more rental properties would, would, would bring the price down. That would only help people that live in public housing, wouldn't it? And you'd never win any votes just helping people who live in public housing. Well, I mean, if it's lowering rents, it's not just lowering rents for people who live in public housing, it's lowering rents for everybody. So everybody who rent would benefit from that, even if you weren't living in public housing. So if the government invested more in public housing, it would lower rents for everybody because it's increased supply of housing yep. and push the rents down. Yeah. But that'd be bad for me. Well, as if, a, I'm, if I'm a landlord. If you're a landlord, absolutely it would be bad for you. Hang on. So if I was a landlord, I'd be... I'd be implacably opposed to public spending on public on public housing. You'd be implacably opposed to increasing you can't the say housing. Implacably, can I you? can't. <laughs> You'd be opposed to increasing housing stock, regardless. Wow. So it's as if the best way to help me is to actually keep rents high. Yeah. Yeah. And not allow new public housing in, and therefore be opposed to, to government policy that, that would increase supply. Right. So I think the answer to the question about anecdotally does helping tenants end up hurting tenants is a, is a pretty clear no from me. And a no from me. <laughs> Matt, have you ever found that a lot of what people say about economics is just complete gibberish, nonsense, rubbish you don't understand? All the bloody time. Well, so have I. And that's why I've updated Econobabble. And in Econobabble, what I try to do is debunk a lot of the nonsense, a lot of the spin, a lot of the dubious arguments that we've been talking about, like the idea that tax cuts are gonna help poor people or hurting, helping renters will hurt renters. So yeah, if you wanna get to the bottom of why we talk so much rubbish about economics in Australia, I'd strongly recommend this book. Indeed, I endorse it. Matt, what do you think about this book? I think it's fantastic. Do you go anywhere without it? N nowhere, that's why I just had it on my lap just then. <laughs> so, if you want to know more about Econobabble, as luck would have it, here's one I prepared earlier. Econobabble, available at all good bookstores soon. And some not so good.